Well, hello everybody out there in Facebook land. Uh, hopefully you guys can hear me. I had a little trouble with my microphone earlier, so hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Uh, as always, make sure that you log on, drop a comment, drop a like, let me know that you can or cannot hear me or see me. So, uh, and with that being said, I want to, you know, welcome everybody we got here in the house tonight, man. This is, uh, this is really cool. We got Jacob, Cliff, Drew, Zach, David, and we got a new guy with us, uh, Stuart. So really, really excited to have somebody, uh, somebody come in that we haven't met before. So I think that'd be really cool. But, uh, but yeah, I hope everybody had a good weekend. We'll give it a few minutes to, you know, get everything going as we usually do. Uh, who got wet over the weekend? Yeah. No. <laughs> Normally I get up here and say something like, oh, yeah, the weather was beautiful. I hope you caught some fish or something like that. But, yeah, this whole week has been kind of a wreck. Um, I don't know. Oh, that's right. You did the concealed carry. Yeah. Yeah, I did concealed carry say, class. It was, not, it was pretty nice out yesterday. Yeah, actually, the we didn't get wet on the range, thank goodness, because it yeah. was outside. Uh, but it did rain some while we were in the class. My wife said it rained pretty good here at the house. So, I, I don't know. Later on in the evening, it yeah, we didn't get out of there until, man, it was after 5 o'clock. We were mm -hmm. up there for a long time. But, uh, <coughs> but cool deal. So, all right, there we go. We got that going. But, no, I called this one Breathing Room. And uh, to the guys that have been in this class for a long time or have been following this for a long time, you'll probably recognize most of this. This is another one of those. I think I've got three left that, um, that we did very early on that I haven't done in video form. So I'm trying to get all those posted up. And I went back through it, and I, I did a lot of, you know, a lot more slides. I think I added eight or ten new slides to it. Um, so some of this information will be familiar to you guys that have seen it before. You know, Stuart, obviously, this will be new to you, so that'd be cool. Uh, and the guys online out there, you know, I, they haven't seen this before either. Because like I said, this is one of the few that I haven't done in video form yet. It's kind of long. I tend to talk really fast. So <laughs> if, uh, if I'm talking too fast, these guys will usually, you know, tell me to calm down. Uh, but I apologize for that because I do I do tend to uh, talk really fast. Hey, looks like we got Randy Forbes on uh, on Facebook too. Hey, what's going on, buddy? Good to see you. Cool deal. Well, let's get into it. So, as we have been doing the past uh, several classes, we're going to go ahead and open with a word of prayer, like we've been doing. And uh, and some of you guys, this is also familiar with. Uh, Pastor put this up. I don't know. It's probably been well. There it is, right there, July twelfth. So it's been about a month ago, a little bit more. And uh, you know, this is just kind of a call to prayer that he put out, uh, especially with small group leaders and, and, you know, anybody in the church that, uh, you know, that, that we would open our classes this way. And, you know, he only asked us to do it one time, but I felt like it was probably important enough to keep doing. Um, and until things kind of settle down, I think we'll just keep doing it. You know, it never hurts to pray. You can't pray too much, right? Um, so cool. So let's, uh, let's open in prayer, if we would, please. <coughs> Father, we, uh, we come to you today thankful and grateful for all you have done, Father, we just uh, we just pray that we would recognize all that you have done for us. And as Pastor said this morning, uh, help us to recognize what we have and not what we don't have, Father. Uh, I would pray that for each and every person that can hear me today. <clears throat> Father, you have uh, heard the needs on this list multiple times. Father, we're praying for parents with kids going back to school tomorrow. Uh, we're praying for business owners. We're praying for church leaders and for anybody affected by this disease. Father, we want to send a special prayer, as we always do, to uh, firefighters, police officers, first responders, uh, military veterans. Father, we just uh, we hold a special place for those, and we would pray your protection over each and every one of those. Uh, pray that each and every person in this room tonight uh, gains something from this, and uh, and we use it to honor you. And it's in Jesus' name, Amen. 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 All right, cool deal. And yeah, these uh, I usually post up a kind of a handout list. I used to hand out papers every week, but uh, with all this going on. I can't get to the print room and that kind of stuff. And so I put up the handout materials online. So if this is something you're into, you can go back and get all these slides, you know, in paper form. Uh, Jacob, can you turn the air down again, buddy? It's getting hot already. So let's get started. I called this one breathing room. So our tie-in tonight is room to breathe, right? So we're talking, we're going to be talking about cylinder heads and, and ports and camshafts and that kind of thing. But uh, our tie-in tonight <coughs> is about note to self. Taking time to care for yourself is not selfish. It is necessary to maintain my physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being. Uh, would you guys agree with that? Yep. You think? Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, what I need to do right now. Yeah, <laughs> you, you and me both. <laughs> uh, in fact, I need to do a lot more of it, unfortunately. Uh, but this is a really cool verse, and uh, I just thought this was a neat way to, that they put it up there. But this is uh, Mark 135. And it says, very early in the morning, 
while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Um, and I think you're going to see this running theme throughout today's class is that, you know, even Jesus, being Jesus, being perfect in every way, took a lot of time to be by himself. Uh, especially you'll notice that when he was praying, you know, there's a lot of examples where he would go off by himself and pray. Uh, and then I've got some examples where, you know, there were large crowds and things, and he was with his disciples, and he would still take some time to go uh, to go be by himself. So if it's, uh, if it's good enough for Jesus to take time from whatever he's doing, which is obviously more important than whatever we're doing, <laughs> and go and be by himself, uh, then I think we should really be able to try harder to do that as well. So with that being said, we'll get into our first uh, our first verse for tonight. And for Stuart, you know, you obviously uh, first time here. The way we typically do this is uh, we do a Bible tie-in in the beginning. So you know, the first first half of the class or so, we'll, we'll go over some verses and uh, how they kind of tie in, and then we'll tie that into an automotive principle in some way, uh, which is becoming increasingly difficult. <laughs> uh, but you know, but we're working it out. We're okay. Unfortunately, cars are really complex, and they got a lot of systems that we can <laughs> we can borrow from. Um, but our first one is Matthew 6, 6 through 8. And this is Jesus talking here. It's in red. Just pay attention. Uh, but when you go pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. So again, this kind of really ties into what we're talking about, as far as uh, being by yourself or getting away. You know, it, it, this is Jesus saying right here that go and pray in private. You know, and that uh, that God obviously knows what you need before you ask him. Uh, but also, you know, <laughs> I like the way it words it. Uh, this is the NIV version, by the way. Uh, but it says, "Do not be like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words." Uh, that kind of struck a chord with me. I talk a lot. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, I, I get what he's saying in this passage, though. You know, he's saying, you know, don't go out there and make a big show of it and, and things like that. Um, just go in private and, and ask God for what it is that, that you need. And I think, I think that was really interesting that he said, you know, specifically to go into the room and close the door by yourself. Uh, this is another example about very similar. So Matthew 14, 22 and 23. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray, and later that night, he was there alone. So this is kind of what we're talking about. So, you know, this is a really good example. He says there's a crowd here, his disciples are there, there's, you know, it's probably this whole big mob scene, you know, you can just imagine what it would be like. And, uh... You know, and afterwards, he's, he's telling the crowd to go away, and he tells his disciples to go away, and he just goes out by himself. How many of us would probably do that? Yeah, you might. I tell them all to go away. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I personally would have a hard time with that. Um, you know, and, and we kind of talked about it at the beginning a little bit, but taking time to be, you know, just, by your, just for yourself. You know, I mean, I got a wife and kids and a job and, you know, we're dealing with church functions and we're doing all kinds of stuff all the time and believe me there's no shortage of distractions you know anytime um but rarely do you get a chance to kind of take time off by by yourself and if my wife is watching this i hope that you take this to heart as well because you know i think you deserve it too so um <clears throat> but that's one of the things that i thought was really interesting is that jesus himself you know thought it was important enough to do it that way and then mark 135 this is uh, the verse that we kind of started with uh, this is the whole verse but very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. And Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I've come. So again, this is a, I like this verse a lot because, again, there's a lot of examples of Jesus going off to pray by himself. But then this particular one I thought was interesting because apparently he didn't tell anybody. You know, it says uh, everyone is looking for you, or, you know, Simon and his companions went to look for him. So at this point, he must have just slipped out, you know, or, or he didn't tell anybody he was going to do it. And I think that really kind of ties into the first verse we were talking about where he wasn't making a big show of it or, or anything like that or, or – 
obviously he's Jesus, so he could have done whatever he wanted to do. Um, but he didn't. He just kind of slipped out by himself and, and went off to pray. And, uh, you know, these guys were all obviously unaware. But uh, I thought that was really interesting. And then it says, let me go to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. <clears throat> I really like that, too. You know, that he's kind of laying it out there, you know, basically. But hopefully what you get from all of this, you know, you guys online, I see we got a few more joiners online too. Savannah, Zachary, good to see you guys. Uh, hopefully what you're getting from this is that it's okay, that it is okay to take time for yourself, that when you do, uh, obviously, you know, it should be spent in prayer. Um, but even if it's not spent in prayer, at least take time for yourself and just kind of get away. And I think that's one of the things that, that I really take to heart. I tell these guys every week, you know, I said, every time I put these together, it's whatever's talking to me. You know, it's like what I need to work on, so, <laughs> which is a lot. Um, <laughs> but then we got Luke 22, 39, 42. So Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall in temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. So I think this is probably one of the most famous verses in the Bible, right? I mean, this is, uh, you know, he's at the Mount of Olives. He's, you know, the end is coming soon. He knows what's coming. Uh, and this is another one of those examples where he really could have done whatever he wanted. I mean, he could have, like it says, called down 10,000 angels. He could have made it so that those soldiers never found him. Or he could have done a lot of different things, um, you know, if he wanted to. But he went off by himself. He prayed. And, uh, and, of course, the most famous line, you know, not my will, but yours be done. So I think that's kind of kind of what we really need to focus on as far as all this is, is concerned. Uh, and I'd really like to apply that. Anybody listening out there or any of you guys, you know, with this whole COVID madness and we got rioting madness and we got election madness and we got all kinds of madness. There's plenty of that. Uh, but I think this is probably the bottom line. You know, not our will, but his be done. You know, and if that's if that's his will, then then so be it, or whatever his will is going to be. You know, we all we all know that he's going to use it for the good of, of those that love him anyway. So, hopefully, that will bring some relaxation. Hopefully, that will let somebody just let it go. Um, you know, and that's that's how, again that's talking to me. <laughs> um, but this is one of those things where I think if everybody that was in the middle of all that, you know, if the politicians, if the people rioting, if people, you know, working on COVID stuff, if all of that would have said. You know, not my will, but God's be done. I think we'd all be in a lot better place. You know, just my opinion. Uh, <laughs> but with that being said, let's get into uh, let's get into a little bit of our automotive tie-in. So we called it breathing room. So at the beginning, we talked about room to breathe. You know, get some breathing room. Get some. Get off to yourself. Get relaxed. Uh, well, with automotive tie-in, we're talking about cylinder heads. No single modification or no single part on a car is going to affect the breathing of an engine more than the cylinder. Um, that's that's just the way it is. It's the way they're designed. It's the way they work. And we're going to talk about uh, all that in just a second. Um, but first, a little bit of history lesson. Basic flathead engine design. So, you know, at one time the world was flat. Or at least the cylinder heads were. Anyway. <laughs> uh, anybody ever taken a head off a lawnmower or something like that? Seen a flathead? Well, in that case, you know, with flathead stuff, and I'm sorry, Stuart, I don't know if you can see that or not, buddy. You good? Okay. Uh, normally, what you know, what we see today is we see overhead valve engines. We see valves in the top. But in the early days, the valves were actually in the block, and there was just a flat chunk of metal, usually steel, and in some cases aluminum uh, or cast iron. But that just covered up the hole basically, and so you had this port that was cast into the block, and the air and fuel and everything had to flow kind of in a funny shape to get into the combustion chamber where it could be compressed and turned into power. This was very limited in how much compression you could run, how much flow they could support. That's why those old flathead motors made you know, very little power relative to what we have today. Uh, it was cheap to produce, it was strong, you know, they could knock them out really fast. And you're talking you know, in the 30s and stuff. Uh, but they do look really cool. <laughs> they don't make any power, but they look awesome. Uh, but this is the typical overhead valve uh, versus the flathead. So you see, this is usually what we see today. The valve is above the piston, above the chamber in some way. It's, it's contained within the cylinder head uh, versus the flat head where you can see it's kind of upside down. You know, this, all this is in the block and there's just a, just a piece of metal over the top of it. 
And I included this picture because that's the old flathead Ford. That's usually what people think of when you say flatheads. You know, you see that in old like 32 Roadster or something. Uh, again, doesn't make a ton of power, but it looks awesome. Uh, but you can see that this head is just a solid piece of metal. That's all it is, and it just bolts down over the over the combustion or you know over the pistons and just seals everything up. But all the intake and exhaust is all happening inside the block. That made it very, very difficult to get very much flow, to get any efficiency or anything like that. You know, you were very limited in the combustion chamber design. Uh, so that was way back when. But now, what we deal with typically looks more like this. This is a typical set of like small block Chevy heads. Uh, this is what you would see. LS heads are this way. You know, Chrysler. You know, any pushrod V8 is usually in this configuration. But they seal the top of the cylinder to cr create a combustion chamber between the head and the top of the piston. They house the valves and the springs with the guides, rocker arms, or cam followers, and ports are machined or cast into to allow airflow of intake and exhaust. So you can kind of see the exhaust ports right here. You can't see the intake ports over there, but this is the combustion chamber here. You see the valves are, are inside there. And we'll, we'll, we've got a better layout of this in just a second. Um, but this is typically what we're dealing with today. Now these can be cast iron or aluminum, just like back then. Obviously aluminum has a lot of advantages. It's light, it's very heat uh, efficient. Uh, but it's also, you know, it's easy to machine, but it's also very expensive. So, you know, these didn't get real popular until recently. Most of the time they were cast iron, cast iron boat anchors. Um, the port size, shape, surface finish are all critical to the torque curve and overall horsepower potential. Cylinder heads also crucial in engine cooling and lubrication. This is one place where a lot of people kind of, they kind of miss the mark with that. The cylinder head has a lot of cooling and, and oil passages in it. So, you know, you, People talk about the flow characteristics and you know the cc's in the chamber and how big the valves are and all that kind of stuff, uh, but they also have to have really well designed oil and cooling uh, passages because you know like anybody here knows that I love Datsuns. Well, they they've got a flaw in theirs with the cooling design, so you end up with one cylinder that's hotter than the rest of them, um, which is kind of an inline six characteristic. But with aftermarket heads, you have to be really careful about buying them. You know, make sure that they have clean good oil passages, make sure that the coolant passages are all clean and good, make sure you use high quality gaskets and things, because I've seen some before, um, Chevy 400 is a good example, you know, 400 small block and 350 small block look identical for the most part, uh, but there are certain holes inside the block that need to be, need to be open, they call them steam holes, but I'm not exactly sure what they're for, I think they're just to let water flow through, uh, but that's why you can't just take the, the head gasket from a 400 or a 350, you know, put it on. Even though they look identical, it has to do with the way the coolant flows through the head. So keep that in mind. It's just one of those things that uh, that will bite you <laughs> if you don't know. <laughs> because you can look at it and just go, oh, yeah, put it on there. It looks just like it. So, yeah. Uh, but this is kind of a, a cool illustration. So anybody who doesn't know, if you, you know, if you've never had one apart or if you never had to experience this, uh, the cylinder head is right here. And then you got the head gasket. And you got the block. You can kind of, kind of, this is kind of a cartoonish illustration, but it does kind of get the point across. You can see, you know, where the intake would be on one side and the exhaust would be on the other, and you can see kind of how it would flow through. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit more about that in just a second. This is this is an overhead cam engine, which is you know typical of what you see today. But yeah, just in case you wasn't sure, this is where we're talking today. We're talking about this piece right here that bolts to the top of the block. The construction of it, like I said before, it's usually cast iron or cast aluminum. You know, some high dollar race car stuff that might be machine built with aluminum or something like that, but that's, you know, you don't see that on street cars typically. It's usually uh, iron or aluminum, and most all modern cars have gone to aluminum. The cast iron aluminum head has two valve combustion chambers. Some have three or four valves. So you can see the valves are machined into the combustion chambers there. Audi is a famous five valve one. They like to use five valves per cylinder. Um, I'm not sure about Porsche or Volkswagen. They probably got some five valve stuff too. But most of what you see <clears throat> is going to be two or four. And uh, I've got a really good illustration of, of the four valve one in just a second. But the two valve one is your typical small block V8 kind of, kind of configuration or, you know, in, you know, small four cylinder, 2.5, 2.0, something like that. They bolt directly to the top of the cylinder block, covers and closes the top of the cylinders, and combustion chambers are small pockets formed in the cylinder head. Combustion occurs in these pockets. See these rings right here, when that spark plug ignites the fuel and you actually create the burn, that's actually where it's happening. And we're going to talk a little bit about quench uh, in just a minute, and that's kind of the area that it happens in. But for the most part, most of all the combustion that happens, it happens in the cylinder head. 
and that's why that shape is very critical. Um, they they have designed these shapes to move the air around in certain ways and to swirl it. You know, the vortex. You know, that's that's where it gets its name from. Um, and what they're trying to do is try and create turbulence because turbulence creates a fast burn, uh, and they want a fast burn so that they can control emissions and, and fuel economy and that kind of thing. You know, those old like Hemi's, you know, old, old Dodge Hemi, uh, real, real slow burning chambers. You know, you had to run way, a whole bunch of timing in those things. Uh, they were a big, giant piston for one thing. Uh, and then, you know, the way that the, the combustion chamber was shaped, it was just a dome. So they would burn rel really slow. So they would run a whole bunch of time. And then in modern cars, they burn really fast. So you, you don't have to run as much time to get the same amount of power out of them. Uh, so yeah, they do they do all kinds of trick things with the combustion chambers to uh, to try and move that air around. Um, and again, I'm not a not an engineer, so I don't know why they do what they do. This one's just for Zach. <laughs> so uh, this is your typical four valve over, uh, dual overhead cam uh, cylinder head. This is what is more typical on most modern cars. <coughs> four cylinder, a V8. <coughs> or in this case an inline six. But either way, this is kind of what you see. This, they, they've kind of got it perfected. Well, I don't know if perfected is the right word. But they've got it to where this is typically the best design that they can come up with. We've got two intake valves and two exhaust valves, uh, very close in size. Uh, you can see the combustion chamber is pretty much hemispherically shaped. They've got a little bit of shape to it, a little bit of quench pads on each end. Um, but for the most part, this is what you're going to see, and you can see on this particular one, the camshafts are on top of the head. It's not like uh, not like an older engine where it has push rods and lifters and rockers and all that, like the other picture. This one, the cams are on the top. Uh, this is the M52 B28 head from BMW. That's why I said Zach would uh, really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, but this this is really typical of what you would see with a modern four valve dual overhead cam. <clears throat> and you can kind of see the major differences in it. You can see how the camshafts are in here. And the, there's a couple of big advantage of running dual overhead cam stuff. So four valves are better than two. So modern DOHC or dual overhead cam systems are generally the best of all worlds in terms of efficiency and power potential. Four small valves allow for greater flow potential than, e than two large ones, allowing very high RPM potential while keeping velocities in check. Disadvantages are generally increased complexity, increased cost, and generally engines that are physically wider and taller for their displacement. I'm going to pause right here for a minute. So, do I have any Corvette fanatics in the house? Anybody that's all about a Corvette? Um, they're still using pushrod motors, and now they're mounted in the back and still using pushrod motors. Um, <laughs> and one of the big reasons that they do that is, is because it keeps the engine physically smaller. So like in the other cylinder head that we saw, the, the regular small block Chevy one, you saw how narrow they were, how you know, they were very small relative to the size of the engine. But with that BMW head, that was only a 2.8 liter inline six, and it was very big. It was wide and it was tall because it had to house the camshafts, and it has you know two of them, and it has extra valves and all of that. So when you add all that up, it makes the engine physically wider and physically taller. So in order to keep the hood line low on the Corvette, they stuck with pushrod motors. Uh, but the big, the big disadvantage to, to pushrod motors is that they can't run, at least none that I've ever seen, has run multiple valves. They don't run more than one exhaust valve and one intake valve. And in order to get enough flow to you know, make a lot of high RPM horsepower, those valves have to be huge. Well, then you lose a lot of velocity because every time that valve opens, it's a big area. You know, and so you lose a lot of that velocity. So in order to keep velocities where they need to be, the valves are sized accordingly. So it's usually a trade-off between you know, a low RPM torque or a high RPM horsepower, but rarely do you get both with a pushrod engine. With the dual overhead cam, not only can you get really high velocities because these are very small openings, but you got two of them, so you got a lot of flow potential. But now with two separate camshafts, these cams can be ground completely independent of each other. So you've got complete control over the intake side and you've got complete control over the exhaust side. And you add to that, Valve variable valve timing, now you can move them independently of each other. So now they can create an engine that actually has the flow characteristics for down low torque and up high horsepower, park throttle cruise, good fuel economy, and they can really move these things around to do everything really well. So, and you don't have all that weight of push rods and rocker arms and 
you know, all that stuff typically breaks. <coughs> GMs. Uh, <laughs> uh, anybody who watches this knows that I love to give GMs a hard time. Um, like I told you before, I've been doing this, uh, this is my 21st year as a professional technician. I uh, went to Lincoln Tech in Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, been ASC Master Tech for, for many, many years. And, uh, and I love to give GMs a hard time. I worked for GM for five years, too. Um, but they do have lifter failures, and they do have rocker arm failures, and they do have valve train failures, uh, especially Tahoe, Suburbans, the Chevy trucks, you know, all the displacement on demand engines uh, since about 08, I guess, is when they started that. Uh, and what happens is, is that they actually have valve train failure, and that causes an engine failure. So they'll have a push rod fail and hold it, you know, or not a push rod, but a lifter fail, and it will hold the valve open, and the piston will come up and snap the top of the valve off. And now you've created a situation where it's beating the inside of the cylinder all to pieces. Um, I've seen valve springs break because, you know, in order to, to run a big cam or to run a <coughs> cam that would be big enough to make any high, high horsepower, you have to run a really stiff valve spring. And of course, they get brittle and you know high RPM and things like that. People don't like to change the oil or they overheat them or whatever they do to them. Uh, but you end up with a failure of of the valve spring, and the same thing happens. It drops the valves down, and then the piston comes up and snaps it. So we want to try to keep the pistons and the valves separate from each other, if at all possible. <laughs> now these things aren't perfect. Uh, dual overhead cam engines they do they do have their um, their disadvantages. You know, the chains are extremely long. So you end up with a, with a big long chain. They're typically heavier uh, because obviously there's four camshafts instead of just one. Um, and you know you have to deal with timing components like tensioners and guides and things that are, that are for potential failure points. Uh, for the most part, though, they've they've got them figured out. So, so let's talk about ports. We talked about the you know four head, uh, four valves per cylinder, and we talked a little bit about how the ports are cast into the cast into the cylinder head. But what are we talking about when we say port exactly? Um, cylinder head ports are critical to the engine's peak power and torque curve. The size and shape need to be optimized for maximum velocity of airflow. And port volumes are generally expressed in cc's and port flow is generally expressed as CFM or cubic feet per minute uh, at a given valve lift. And I've got a chart that shows that in just a second. But when we're talking about the port, because we're going to use that term quite a bit coming up, we're talking about the actual part that the air flows through. Can everybody see that okay? Can, does that make sense? Um, this is a cutaway of a cylinder head, and it doesn't matter if it's overhead valve or overhead cam it, or whatever the case is. The valve will be in the head some way, and it will be actuated some way. Either the cam is riding on the top of it, or it's got rocker arms or whatever. But either way, the, cam, the valve will be actuated, and it will be opened up a certain distance. That's what we call valve lift. When you talk about a camshaft, you talk about you know a 380 lift or 500 lift or 600 lift or whatever. We're talking about that distance right there in tenths of an inch. So 600 would be 0 0.600 of an inch. Um, and what we're talking about port, we're talking about this section right here. Now this is kind of a cutaway. You have to kind of imagine that that would be a, a tube, you know, or, or an open space. But you can just see by looking at it that it's a, it's a pretty complex shape. I mean, you know, it's not, just a, it's not just a pipe that sticks down in there. And then on top of that, you know, there has to be something to support the valve. You know, we got to have a valve there. And we got to have some way to get it into the cylinder, so we usually have some sort of bends, and you know they can have all kinds of funny shapes and, and whatnot. And the big deal about the port is, like I said over here, is that sizing is critical. Now, I know you got some experience porting heads, right? So Cliff, you know, he's he worked at a race shop for a little while. He's he's done some head porting stuff. Um, and the, the problem here is that this is always a compromise, just like everything else we talk about with these cars. There's always a compromise to be had. You can do a really huge port that flows a ton of air, but everywhere else it, it'll be lazy. You know, you'll have a lazy port because what you end up with is when that valve opens, we were talking about velocity earlier, you've got a column of air coming in behind it, and you want that air to be moving as fast as possible because you want to get as much air as, a, as you can inside that combustion chamber before that valve shuts. I mean, these valves are typically only open you know, 280 degrees, 260 degrees of uh, crankshaft rotation. So they're not open very long. I mean, at 5,000 RPM, that's really fast. So what you end up with is you need velocity. And just like, you know, uh, blowing through a straw, if you blew through a little straw or your water hose, you know, you'd have some velocity. If you made it smaller, now that velocity increases, but the flow decreases. You know, you put your thumb over it, you can shoot the water hose further, but you're shooting less water. So that's kind of the trade-off. 
<clears throat> so you need to be, be aware of port sizing, keeping velocities up. And this is very, very critical when it comes to camshaft selection too, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So porting theory. Cylinder head porting refers to the process of modifying the intake and exhaust ports of an internal combustion engine to improve quality of the airflow, quantity and quality in most cases. Uh, make sure the guys online can see that. Cylinder heads as manufactured are usually suboptimal for racing applications due to design and made for maximum durability. That's why they're so thick. Now, that's not always the case. We can pick on BMW for a little bit. <laughs> uh, that BMW head that I showed a picture of earlier, uh, they're very notorious for cracking because there are thin spots in them. And, uh, and if they get overheated, they, it's over. I mean, they just, they just usually don't stand up to it. Uh, you know, big old cast iron four liter Jeep head, you know, you probably take a torch to that sucker <laughs> and probably won't hurt it. Uh, so yeah, that's, you know, that's just a generalization, but uh, it does apply because, you know, obviously the manufacturer wants, they want to knock these things out as quickly and as cheaply as possible. And almost all cylinder heads, like I said, except for some rare billet type stuff, is, uh, is cast in some way, either cast aluminum or cast iron. And when you cast something, you end up with this rough surface. You end up with these seams, you end up with this roughness, you know, you end up with this casting flash, and it's a very complex shape, so you know, there's really no good way to kind of grind that out of there, not really quickly anyway. Uh, but what we as, you know, guys that are looking for a little more horsepower do, is we'll go in there with a die grinder and grind all that out and make it all nice and smooth. You see this is not done, and this is done. You see this one has not been done, and this one is done. So you kind of see the difference there? So not only are you smoothing it out, you know, because obviously you want to try and flow more air, but, you know, guys that really know what they're doing will change the shape of these ports as well. We'll try to take advantage of, you know, venturi effects and stabbing and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, in some extreme cases, I've seen some race boat engines where they'll actually change the angle. They'll actually pick the port up like that and fill this with epoxy or weld or something like that and actually raise the whole thing up to try and make the angle different. Uh, and they do it with the exhaust too. They'll actually raise the raise the exhaust ports up, and they'll fill underneath it with something else. And, uh, I think motorcycle guys, you know, Harley Davidson guys, they do that stuff too. They change the angle on the on the heads. But that's all like really really advanced stuff that none of none of us here in this room is going to do. But <laughs> it's kind of good to know why. I mean, if you went and bought some hot rod and saw that done, you know, you might want to ask the guy. Oh, Danny Davis says uh, as cast ported is an option. That's true, and I'm guessing with CNC machines being, uh, you know, being much more readily available than they used to be, uh, they probably have a much better option as far as porting these. Because nowadays you can buy CNC ported heads, and they'll actually put it on a, you know, put it on a machine that will go in and do it all. And you know, it's not some cat sitting behind a die grinder, you know, over 100 hours. Uh, so yeah, with machine, with CNC machining being much more readily available, I can see that being the case. I've never bought a, you know, ported factory cylinder head, but. All right, let's see what kind of gains we can we can get you know from porting. This is a really cool. This is from a book, um, modifying and hot rodding small block Chevys. Uh, you know, it's probably one that most people are familiar with. Um, but I thought this was a really good chart because this is actual flow bench data. This is actually somebody that ports heads for a living, uh, and he actually you know kind of kind of shared this with us. And I thought this was really interesting. So while cylinder head porting is usually best left to the professionals, which I agree with. Uh, <laughs> It's extremely precise and tedious work. The results can be much better flowing port, though. It's extremely important to be mindful of the relationship between the cam profile and the cylinder head port volume, and we'll talk about that in a second. Too much cam lift with poor flowing cylinder head will create a bottleneck in the cylinder head, and no performance will be gained once the point of maximum port flow is reached. So that's kind of a really wordy way of saying you could spend 100 hours or $10,000 or whatever to do all this cylinder head porting, and you put a tiny little baby cam in it, and you gain nothing. Because that cam, or uh, yeah, that cam is only gonna flow so much because it only has a certain amount of lift and only has a certain amount of duration. So once you reach that point, all the flow in the world isn't gonna help you. But you can also do it the other way. So the cylinder heads that are too large for the cam being used will have very poor velocity and lazy under all circumstances, except for extremely high RPM. So that example we just talked about, you spend all that time and money porting the cylinder head, you stuck a little baby cam in there, 
it, the thing's a slug everywhere. It's probably slower than it was before you messed with it until you get really high in the RPM range where you can take advantage of that velocity with that big torque. Uh, so camshaft profile has a lot to do with it. You can see that really good on this chart. Let's see if I can get it zoomed in for these guys. So on this side, we're talking about airflow and CFM. And that's, like I said, that's just the standard measurement they use. You know, anybody ever heard of like a Holley 750? You know, that's what they're talking about, 750 CFM. That's what it can flow. Um, so what we're talking about is cubic feet per minute. So it doesn't really matter what it is. We're just looking for a change. On this side, you see valve lift. So you remember earlier when I showed you that valve and how far it was open? You know, that's what we're talking about here. And that's 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700. Most street cars kind of live in this 3 to 5 range. Um, you know, you put big old 550 cams and stuff in like some race car stuff, but most of what we drive around and most of the stuff that we deal with are kind of going to be in this 3 to 5 range. Well, you can see on this chart here that the red is the exhaust and the green, or the blue rather, is the intake. You can see at 500 lift, unported, just factory head, just, you know, this is a, uh, I think this is a, might be a Vortec head. I'm not really sure. This is an early Chevy head, but bone stock. You can see the exhaust is flowing about 130 CFM, you know, at 500 lift, and the intake is flowing around 185 or so, somewhere around there, uh, at 500 lift. And like I said, most street cars are going to be even less than that. But after porting, we can see the exhaust. Now we're flowing well over 200, and the intake is flowing off the chart. It's it's way up there, 250 at 500. It's touching the line at 500. But you can kind of see the relationship here between lift and flow. So you see at these low lift levels, even the best head, even the really good head, is flowing quite a bit less than it is at a higher lift. And that's really good, uh, really good representation of the relationship between lift and flow. So you know when you when you're talking about that, that's something that really needs to be kept in consideration. But if you had this set of heads and then you bolted on that set, that sucker would be a hot rod because you can see on the ported side it starts picking up flow real early. I mean, we're out flowing the stock head, I mean, right there, less than less than 100 thousandths. So that sucker is out flowing it across the board. And if, you know, you saw one where it really wasn't doing much until right here, you know, that that's kind of what you got to be mindful of. You got to be mindful of how it flows, not just how much it flows. That's why you don't want to just open the Summit catalog and buy the biggest set of heads that they got in there. Uh, you'd be sorely disappointed. <laughs> Unless you can put a giant turbo on it, and then, it's, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> so what does that CFM mean as far or I mean, uh, what does all that mean as far as power? So cylinder head ports are generally sized in cc's, just like combustion chambers. So like you, you know, buy a set of Edelbrock 195s, they're going to be 195 cc's, or 175, or 250, or whatever it is. And you can kind of see a really big difference in horsepower potential. So if we're trying to make 400 horsepower, we want, you know, that's, that's a pretty small port, it's 165. Actually, 165 would be really good, about, four, about 400. Uh, but you want to see, you know, you want to try to make 650 horsepower, we need some big, giant ports. So this is really where, you know, having a realistic expectation, a realistic goal of what kind of power you're trying to make uh, would really factor in big on your, on your cylinder head decision. Because you wouldn't want to, you know, make, say, 375 horsepower and you know 10 to 1 compression like I'm just gonna run this around on the street it's not a race car and go out and put a set of you know AFR 230s on it <laughs> I mean it would be it would be a pig but at the same time you wouldn't want to build this 14 to 1 giant solid roller cam monster and you know put these little 170s on it you know I mean because no matter what you do to it that cylinder head's not going to flow any more than that you know so it's very important to try and keep those two things uh, in mind Questions? Questions? Questions online? Anybody? Stuart, have I lost you, buddy? You with me? Um, lost, but enjoying it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, I do talk fast, and I apologize. Um, and I will be honest that this started as a, like I said before, I, I'm a mechanic, and you know, in dealing with customers, I, I really felt like it would be good if customers were more informed. Uh, so they come into the shop, and if they can. I understand what I'm telling them or if they can relay to me what it is that they're trying to, you know, trying to say other than, you know, it made a <laughs> sound, you know. <laughs> uh, so a lot of these earlier classes were much more uh, based around that. It was, it was very, it was a little bit lower level. 
Now, as these guys have been with me for about a year now, uh, we've 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 dove deeper and deeper yeah. into some principles, into some into some design things. Um, but again, like I said, hopefully you 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 know you're with us, you're, you're good. Uh, but feel free, man. Questions, anything. <laughs> Danny. So for you guys that don't know, Danny Davis, he's a guy that's watching online. He's got a speed shop uh, out in Goldsboro called East Coast Speed. Uh, shout out to Danny Davis. Put my check in the mail, buddy. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, he's on here. Uh, he's on here making jokes. Three quarter cam and double hump heads. Yeah, come on. I, I, everybody's heard that, right? <laughs> That's all right, Danny. He still only makes 185 horsepower. <laughs> but no, he's a good dude. Anybody out there looking for some uh, American muscle type hot rod stuff? Uh, he's the guy to go see. And I'll go ahead and plug my other my other buddy that's probably watching is David Younger. He's got an import shop out there, Speedworks in Goldsboro, also. So, you got a GTR? Go see David. You got a Camaro? Go see Danny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's fair to both of them. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, talk about valves. So we so we we showed a little bit about the valve earlier about how how it's in the head and you know how its lift can uh, uh, you know affect the flow and that sort of thing. Uh, but the valve itself is actually pretty complex. I mean, it looks like just a stick of metal, uh, but there's actually a lot going on here, and it has to live in some pretty extreme conditions. Um, and there's actually a lot of performance to be gained just at the valve. The engine's valves are responsible for letting air into the cylinders and sealing against the chamber, uh, and sealing against chamber pressures, and allowing the burnt air fuel mixture away out of the uh, chamber through the exhaust. Typically, engines have two intake valves and up to three exhaust valves. That's that uh, Audi five-cylinder deal. I'm not sure if it's three on the intake or, two, or three on the exhaust on those, but either way, it's, it's an outlier. Nobody should be taking the head off an Audi, uh, myself included. <laughs> <laughs> valves are required to be very strong, yet light as possible. They need to withstand extremely high temperatures and transfer that heat to the cylinder head while opening and closing thousands of times per minute. So the camshaft runs at half of engine speed. So, you know, at 5,000 RPM, the camshaft is turning 2,500. So these things are opening and closing 2,500 times a minute, you know, and at 7,000, obviously, it's, it's way, way more. Uh, so these things are opening and closing extremely fast, and they have to deal with some extreme temperature differentials. So at the face or the head of the valve, we've got combustion chamber pressure and combustion chamber temperature, which can be extremely high. Uh, in some cases, when things go really wrong, high enough to melt aluminum. Uh, but on the back side of this, this is this is air on the back side of it. So you got this cold air on the back side, you got this extremely hot combustion chamber on the other side. So it needs to transfer that heat really quickly, and it does that through the face of the valve and through the cylinder head. So this is another place where I talked about cylinder head being you know really important to the cooling. Uh, it's actually you know controlling temperature quite you know in the valve, and there's water jackets and things like that that all run through there. But when you hear somebody talk about a burnt valve, that's what happens, is that a hot spot is created for some reason. Uh, there's, you know, they can run lean or, or pre-ignition or whatever the case is, uh, but it actually burns a corner of the valve off. It literally, like you took a blowtorch and just, and I've actually seen that quite a bit. Uh, Chrysler's are good for that. Uh, but they, they, you can have a burnt valve, and that's what they're talking about. It literally burns a chunk of the valve off, and now you don't have any compression, because when the piston comes up, this is supposed to be shut. If there's a big chunk missing out of it, all your pressure just escapes right past that. Um, these can get bent. You break a timing belt, timing chain, or something like that, and it kisses the piston, and they can get bent. And now they don't. Now they don't seal. So again, when the piston comes up and it tries to create compression, it just pushes all of that, you know, right past it. So they're very, very important. And this is how they're typically laid in there. This is another cutaway, and I thought this was a really good one. Uh, can everybody see that? Okay, I'm not sure. Never sure how these come out on TV because I got a glare right here where I'm at. <laughs> so, uh, but you can see in this one, you've got the intake valve here, and this is an actual cylinder head that's been cut, so you can see really well, you know, how these chambers are shaped, uh, usually in pretty odd shapes. Uh, and you see the valve guide here. That's usually a piece of bronze, or brass, or some sort of material that this thing can ride on, and it holds it steady. You know, old, older cars usually have a lot of problems with valve guides, but I haven't seen that in the newer ones, but I'm sure somebody out there will, uh, will, will correct me on that. But yeah, the, you see the way it seals against the cylinder head. That seal is extremely important. Um, that, like I said, not only does it cool the valve, 
can transfer heat into the cylinder head, but also it seals the compression, uh, the combustion chamber. So when you've got that burn going on, you get this cylinder pressure spiking. This valve has to be able to stand up to that. A few different uh, pictures here I thought were pretty cool. So these all look the same, right? I mean, if you were to pick any one of them up, you might say, well, this is, this is the same thing. Uh, but down there, you've got regular steel valves. And then a little bit lighter, you can see where they necked it down. What they're trying to do there is make the valve a little bit lighter and also not impede the air quite as much. You know, anything impeding the air obviously is a flow restriction, so they neck it down a little bit to try and try and prevent that. Then they got Inconel, which is really, really wild, you know, I guess it's some form of stainless steel. I'm not exactly sure what it is. Uh, but it can stand up to really high temperatures and it's relatively light. Sodium filled Corvettes are good for that too. They got sodium filled, they're hollow, and they fill them with sodium. Again, trying to make them light, trying to make them transfer heat. And then titanium valves. They actually do make valves out of titanium. How they do that, I don't know. But it would be cool to have some. <laughs> but the reason that you want these to be really light is because we saw earlier how the camshaft was opening and closing them really, really fast. Well, the heavier that valve is, the harder that that valve spring has to work to control it. Because if you've got a big, heavy valve and a big cam, and you, that cam comes around and throws the valve open, well, it's got its momentum, you know, it's going to have inertia now. So the valve spring has to control that, because if it loses contact with the camshaft, you know, now bad things are happening. Uh, so that valve spring has to be stiff enough to make sure that it is in contact with the cam at all times. And the lighter the valve, the easier it is to control, so the faster you can turn it. And the faster you can turn it, that's the, uh, that's the, that's the important part. <laughs> Everybody here knows that I harp on this, so it's actually really cool that we got a new person here. So somebody here that hasn't heard this yet. Uh, I am the biggest harper in the world about top tier fuel, about using tier one gasolines. Uh, this is a result of not using tier one fuel. Uh, so your engine's dirty little secret. Protect your fuel system from its number one enemy. Its number one enemy is Zach on a cross course. I think he's a number two. Yeah, maybe number two enemy. This is still number one. <laughs> Actually, I'd say number one enemy is heat. As long as you keep an engine cool, it'll usually live. But heat, heat is definitely an enemy. Uh, but this is carbon buildup. And this is something that we're seeing more and more with modern cars. And again, these guys have probably heard this. This is something that I harp on a lot. You guys out there on Facebook, if you've heard it, sorry. Uh, yeah. But you, <laughs> you need to know it. Uh, so this is carbon buildup. And... Most, you know, we were talking about it earlier about uh, gasoline direct injection, you know, GDI, which is pretty standard on most cars nowadays. Uh, that, that car out there is an 11, it's direct injected. Your wife's car is what, a 16, 17? Something like that. Something like that. Yeah, it's direct injected. So, I, and you know, most everything you see now within the last five years is, is direct injected. I know Hyundai and Kia have been doing it for a long time. Well, you saw earlier about how that valve was positioned in the cylinder. And you saw that the air had to flow past this. This opens up and the air flows past it to get into the combustion chamber. And we mentioned how any you know, restriction is a restriction in flow. And restriction in flow is a restriction in efficiency and power and everything else. Well, how well do you think air is going to flow past that raster? Not very good at all. Uh, and what happens is, is that with direct injected engines, the fuel is directed or directly injected into the combustion chamber. It doesn't flow past the valve. See, in older engines, even carbureted ones, it was an air-fuel mixture, so you had air and fuel mixed, and it would flow past the valve and keep that washed off for the most part. I mean, granted, carbon still built up because that's what it does, uh, but for the most part, you know, it wasn't a big a problem. Well, now there's no fuel flowing past this valve. It's just air. And with that being the case, you end up with this carbon buildup because there's, you know, remnants of leftover fuel and a little bit of reversion, and you've got condensation and cooling and heating and all this stuff. All this stuff that creates a, an environment where carbon can build up. And with direct injected motors, fuel never touches that, so it just keeps on building up. And that's the problem that we, that we run into, which is why it's extremely important to use top-tier fuels. And I know everybody here is sick of hearing it. <laughs> top-tier gasolines. Fuel, these fuel detergents are so important that including them in gasoline is mandatory in the United States. Top tier gasoline brands, however, significantly exceed the minimum detergent requirements set by the EPA. Using this type of gas can improve the health of your car's engine. It, it is very important. And see, this is a really interesting uh, graphic right here. 
that's using tier one fuel, and that's using cheap, whatever, bare minimum, whatever will get you by fuel, and that's 10,000 miles. I mean, now, when you say in top tier, you're talking Shell or BP? Yep, Shell, Exxon, BP, Mobile, Sunoco. Um, the name brand. Yeah, the name brand stuff. And you know that you probably remember the ads, you know, for Shell and Exxon, you know, talking about clean burn or whatever, you know, they always advertise some sort of clean thing, and that's what it is. It's an additive package. You know, when fuel is made, you know, it's made from oil, and they do whatever they do to it, and they, it, it is what it is. It's gasoline. But then when somebody like Shell or Exxon or Sunoco or VP or whoever buys it, uh, they add their packaging to it, and then they sell it as their brand of fuel. Well, you know, with, with the discount places, you know, you, they don't know. They don't control where that fuel comes from. You know, they buy it from whoever will sell it to them at best price that day. So maybe you got a couple tankers full of really good stuff. Maybe you got a couple tankers full of not so good stuff. But they don't control it because they don't make it. And that's what they're talking about with top tier. They're talking about manufacturers, people that actually add the, the additive packages to it. Uh, my personal favorite is Shell and BP. Uh, that's you know they've seen it perform really well over the years. Um, but any of the Exxon Mobil. Um, I don't think you guys have Sunoco's here. We used to have those in Virginia. Um, Do we have any Yeah, I think there's two shells uh, around here. There's a lot of BPs. And people ask me all the time about these uh, kangaroos, speedways, uh, Murphy's. Murphy's uh, what's, the, what's the other big one? Um, Wawa, places like that. You know, And I don't personally know. Uh, I don't know if they manufacture it. I don't know if they have their own brand of fuel. Um, I, th I guess that's one of those things you'd have to research because you know I get asked that a lot, and, and I don't know. So my personal cars, uh, they all get BP just because I, I trust it. And you know, you're talking about 20 cents, you know, so it's two dollars on 10 gallons. And that's fine. It's the price I'm willing to pay. <laughs> I have to put premium in my cars anyway. But now, would it, would it matter whether you run? Premium or regular? That is an excellent question. I'm glad you asked. And no, no, it doesn't. Um, so so the, the premium won't clean, won't no. clean it off any better. And yeah. and that is one of the things that I think is most misunderstood when it comes to fuel. Uh, so the octane rating is actually a, how fast it burns. So a, a higher octane fuel will burn slower. And that's where a lot of people kind of get mixed up because if you've got a low compression, uh, regular standard street car, uh, you will actually lose performance running a high octane fuel. Now, modern EFI, they can, they can, the computer can recognize what's going on and make adjustments, obviously. But regardless, you're not taking advantage of the slower burn of the higher octane. If you've got, you know, no turbo, low compression, you know, lightweight car, that kind of thing. With the higher octane, it burns slower. So they, you know, it's meant to deal with a lot higher combustion chamber pressure and a lot higher combustion chamber temperature because we'll see in just a second, actually. I think it's, yes, this one. Uh, so that was a really good question. Uh, so what we're trying to do is we're actually trying to control this flame front. And with a high octane fuel, this flame front moves slower. Well, the fuel burns slower, I should say. It doesn't necessarily move slower. slower. The fuel burns slower. And the reason that's important is because at really high, high pressures, this fuel can actually combust on its own, like a diesel. And if that happens, now you end up with pressure differential between the top and the bottom. You actually got two explosions basically pushing against each other. Uh, anybody's ever seen the inside of an engine that's been detonated, you know, pre-ignition, uh, that you can see it actually do some real, real damage. Uh, but with the higher octane fuel, it slows that down, and so it does. It's, it's less susceptible to that. That's why race cars run 116, 120 octane, or whatever the case, because they got a lot of compression or a lot of boost, making a lot of pressure. But with most modern street cars, uh, that's not the case. So a lower octane will be fine, but it still has to be a top tier brand because the top tier is just the additive package. Oh, the paint. Yeah. The car has a paint. Yeah, they put the same detergent and the same lubricants and all the same chemicals or whatever in the fuel, uh, regardless of the of the octane. It's the brand name. You know, it's the, the manufacturer is actually what makes the difference. So now running running high, uh, you know, high test or whatever they call it. You know, it, it, that's no good. Now, I'm glad you said that though, because if you do have a turbo car or a high compression car, a you know high performance car, it is imperative that you run a high octane fuel. Um, the red car out there is is a 335 turbo. 
uh, and it's direct injected, so I got two things to deal with. Uh, but I, you, that does require high high clean fuel because it is a turbo car, and most modern cars now are going to turbo. So it's something that you need to be really aware of. So like with the old lady's car, cause say she's got a turbo on her, right? Yes. Does it? Is your is her car turbo truck? Yeah. Okay. Because it's a little two point. Yeah, it's it's one of the little one six or one eight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that is an area where where higher octane fuel would be a benefit, absolutely. Uh, but it's also an area where top tier fuel is very important. You might want to say why. Yeah, and with with the turbo uh, for you guys out online or for anybody here, uh, what you're doing is you're actually creating more pressure in this in the combustion chamber by using a external compressor, for lack of a better word. Uh, it can be a turbocharger or a supercharger or whatever, but you've got an external compressor that is actually shoving more air into the engine than it could intake by itself. So, you know, if you had a, a hose here, you know, and it pulled down on the piston, it would take in some air, but if you had a leaf blower on it, now it's taking in a lot more air. Well, because the combustion chamber size doesn't change, but you've crammed more air into it, the pressure has now increased. And as pressure increases, heat increases. And so anytime you have heat build up in the combustion chamber, that's when it's important to, to have a, a very high octane fuel to slow that burn down. Um, that's also like if you get into ignition timing, you would you would make the timing later so that you know you don't have a too high a cylinder pressure too early in the stroke. Uh, but yeah, I didn't know her car was turbo. I would definitely definitely recommend you running a high octane uh, fuel in that. Um, but yeah, that's one thing I was going to say is that a lot of modern cars, even small cars, um, you know, hers is a not a cruise. What is that? Uh, Encore. Yeah, yeah, Enclave uh, or whatever. Yeah, Encore. that the Chevy Cruze, the uh, Fords, you know, the little turbo uh, Focuses and Fiestas, and uh, I'm not sure who else is doing. Uh, is Hyundai or Kia doing turbos? Yeah. yeah, they're doing turbos on their little engines now. Uh, so these are not what you would consider high performance cars. You know, when you think turbo, you're thinking, you know, really hot rod cars usually. Um, you know, Mitsubishi Eclipse or WRX STI or, you know, turbo BMW or something like that. But nowadays, they're using turbochargers to augment these very, very tiny engines. Uh, so it, even though it's not a necessarily performance car, uh, they're still using the same technology. They're using direct injection, they're using variable valve timing, and they're using turbocharging. And so they require the same care that the old, you know, hot rod cars required. Uh, and I've talked about that before, you know, a lot of people think, I don't want one of those, they're, they're expensive to maintain, you know, or whatever. Well, we're, we're here. Now all the little economy cars are using the same technology that the Mercedes and the BMW and the Porsches have been using for quite some time. Uh, and the reason that people kind of think that they're high maintenance is because they do require special oils, they do require high dollar fuels, they do require, you know, to be changed frequently, that kind of thing. So yeah, you can buy a turbo BMW or a Chevy Cruze and the maintenance is going to be the same. <laughs> so yeah, that's only, that's definitely one thing to keep in mind for sure. Um, I don't I don't think we're going to get through all of these. Uh, I don't want to run you guys all night. I thought this was a really cool illustration of uh, combustion chamber shapes. It's just, you know, the wedge shape, pancake, the hemi. Uh, pent roof is pretty much what everything's gone to because it... Uh, it fits, you know, fits the valves nicely, and they figured out how to make that flow really well. Combustion chamber size, we talked about that last week. Um, I'm going to skip that one for now because I want to get to this. So this is typically where the failure happens with cylinder heads. And, uh, and I'm, I'm running a little bit behind, so I want to go ahead and just get this one knocked out. So we talked about cylinder head. We talked about what it's made from. We talked about what it does. We talked about modifying it. And that's all fine and good. You can have the best high dollar AFR in the world sitting on your bench right now. But if you don't seal it to the block, then it does you no good whatsoever. Amen, Zach? Mm. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Zach's a trooper, man. That's my son. If for you guys out there don't know it, uh, I love him to death. And he's building a, uh, an N52 V28 right now. And this is where we're at, actually, is, is head to block sealing. So I like to give them a hard time. It's all right. So the two most commonly used head gasket types are the composite type and the multi-layered steel or MLS type. Composite head gaskets are made from layers of various materials, usual forms of, usually forms of graphite and fiber layered over a steel core, and typical of street or OE gaskets. They're weaker under pressure, but more forgiving to surface finish variation. We'll talk about that in just a second. <coughs> 
Metal or MLS gaskets are typically stamped from stainless steel and incorporate some embossing for a spring effect uh, during a head lift situation. Which, you know, like I said, that's, that's under some pretty extreme circumstances. Uh, but generally considered unblowable, quote unquote, don't quote me on that. Yeah. yeah. I would never call any head gasket unblowable, but <laughs> if properly installed, <laughs> let, yeah, let's make sure we finish that sentence. If properly installed and torqued, but require extreme care and surface finish, which is why I didn't recommend it on your property. But the composite, this is typically what you'd see. So, you know, there's a core there of steel. It's stamped out in the shape that it needs to be. And there's some fiber and some graphite, and they, you know, they, they glue all that together in some kind of machine. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how they make it stay. Uh, but then they got the MLS, and that's literally three pieces of steel that are specially stamped and specially fit. And like I said, with the spring effect, you end up with these embossments, these raised sections uh, in the gasket. And what they do is they actually push against, you know, when you tighten them down, they're actually pushing against the, each side of it. And now it's just three layers of steel, so there's nothing there to burn or bend or blow or anything like that. But that has, that has to have a perfectly flat finish. And the finish can't have too many scratches, you know, and when I say scratches, I mean like microscopic, like at a machine level. Uh, but these composite gaskets, they're actually soft, you know, they've got, they got layers of graphite and fiber, so when you clamp them together, you actually end, like up, you end up with like a, yeah, where it mates. But this is also why you can't reuse these. You know, once you torque them down, you know, and they get hot and, and they get set, they're set. You can't take them off and put them back on. Um, I have heard of people reusing MLS gaskets. I've never personally reused one, uh, but I guess, you know, if it's not hurt, I, I guess you could. But uh, I've never personally tried it. When we talk about head gaskets, we're talking about it right here. It's like Volvo. Yeah, sure is. <laughs> yeah, Volvo five cylinder, uh, or maybe a. I think Audi has some five cylinders too. Uh, hey man, shout out to two point five TS sixty though. It's a great motor. Um, but anyway, most failures occur between the cylinder head and block sealing surfaces. That's 90% of the failures you're going to see when it comes to cylinder heads is usually head gasket failures. Um, except for <coughs> GM, that break, you know, valve train components. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I wish you guys out there could see David's face. And trust me, you would do the same thing if you could. <laughs> uh, but... The extreme pressure and heat from pre-ignition or detonation can physically damage pistons, cylinder heads, and blocks, resulting in the loss of sealing ability. And you remember we talked earlier about, you know, anytime that there's a gap in that combustion chamber, when that piston comes up to make pressure, it's trying to push out in all directions. So it can go out the cylinder head gasket, it can go through the valve, it can go anywhere to a microscopic crack, whatever the case is. Uh, it's any loss of compression is, is a loss of power, loss of efficiency. And in a head gasket's case, because you have oil and coolant running through it, uh, you usually end up with coolant in it, you know, mixing the uh, coolant and oil, or you end up burning oil or burning coolant or whatever the case is. So it's a bad deal all the way around. Overheat conditions. I should have put this in big, big, bold letters. This is usually what kills head gaskets. Can also cause cylinder head gasket failures due to the relative motion of the cylinder head against the block as the heat causes expansion in different areas at different rates. So even if these two chunks of metal were made out of the same material, they're not the same size, they're not the same density, they're not the same shape. So if you were to heat them up, they would still expand at different rates. But you throw into the mix, that's generally aluminum, and that's generally cast iron. Now you heat them up, now they're moving all over the place. You know, aluminum expands a, a, a lot faster uh, when it gets hot. So usually what happens when you overheat one is that the, pit, the cylinder head will actually move in relative to the block. And I mean, it's not like you can see it, but you know, it's a very small amount. But it's enough that it actually creates a gap. And once that gap is created with that you know, regular fiber type uh, head gasket, it burns a hole in it and then, and then you're done. But overheating is the number one killer I've ever seen. So this all kind of cycles back to the maintenance we were talking about. You know, keep the coolant level checked. If you have a coolant leak or something like that, or, or a radiator stopped up, or a, a fan that doesn't work, or something simple like a thermostat sticking, could cost you an engine. You know, and that's that's generally what happens. Every uh, every head gasket failure that I get that's overheat related, uh, there's generally a small failure. You know, a pinhole in the radiator. Uh, you know, a water pump belt that 
that broke or you know a, a tooling fan that quit and you didn't know it uh, especially with modern cars they all run electric fans so it's not like you know you can hear it running or anything usually uh, so that's why it's very very important again this kind of goes back to you know you don't want to just ride around with with stuff like that leaking or stuff like that broken uh, because that's an instance where you know an eighty dollar you know part could cost you a four thousand dollar motor or in some cases more than that um, and just to illustrate that this is the last one this is just some ways that head gaskets fail gas leakage between the combustion chambers gas leakage from combustion chamber to coolant gas leakage just to the outside just outside into the atmosphere oil leakage into the coolant oil leakage into the environment water leakage into the oil and water leakage to the environment so all of those can be a result of head gasket failure and like i said nine times out of ten head gasket failure comes from one of two things detonation or overheat uh, detonation is, is caused by running a too low of octane too much time and too much boost you know it's always created by some sort of overpressure situation uh, and, and then overheating, of course, like I said, you know, you can have a $12 thermostat stick and take your whole motor down. Uh, so it's very important to try and keep these things cool, keep them full of coolant, and make sure you keep your maintenance up. Anybody have any questions at this point? I see we've got some more people joining. Tyler, Chris, good to see you guys on there. I know I talk really fast, but you guys are used to it by now. So, <laughs> Stuart, man, uh, questions, comments, anything? Glad to know about top tier gas. Yeah, good. All right. He gained something today. That is a win. Right on. All right. Good deal. Good deal. Won't be the last time you hear about it either. <laughs> that is a true story. Uh, I am a stickler for that 100%. No, I don't own any stock in any fuel companies. As long as you're on the reference, I mean, if you can get 93 at a cheap price. Right. And that's, and that's what we were talking about when David asked that. You know, So it's not so much the octane. That's not what we were concerned with. You need to run the octane that your car requires regardless uh, but you want to run top tier fuel especially in direct injection engines which is like I said everything from about 16 up BMW has been doing it for since about 08 I think uh, Mercedes has been doing it for a long time Volvo uh, but now it's trickled down into economy cars you know <coughs> focuses and fiestas and cruises and things like that so yeah you're seeing everything now um, Cliff man anything you good what about gas treatment you know, that's a good question, man. I don't see where they could hurt. You know, Seafoam, Lucas, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I can't. I don't see where they could possibly hurt because, again, like we talked about with the top tier fuels, what they're doing is they're adding a detergent package, uh, mm -hmm. which is essentially what those fuel treatments are doing. How do you know what you're getting in the bottle? You know, I, I don't know. Is it is it tinted kerosene? Is it actually some kind of chemical that does some good? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Um, would I, would I risk my engine on it? Probably not. But would I try it? <coughs> Absolutely. Uh, I love Lucas products as far as oil products go. Um, so, you know, that would probably be the brand that I go just because that's the one that I trust. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, Lucas can send me a uh, check in the mail too. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I'm with you. I, I honestly don't see where they can hurt. The only thing that I would be a little concerned with, and I don't think it's a problem, I've never heard of it being. Uh, but with modern cars, obviously the catalytic converters are very sensitive, and I would right. be I would be a little concerned about maybe what I was putting on the converter. In an older car, you know, something a little less a little less sensitive to that, I'd say run it. I um, that. Yeah. Every so often, I get a can of oh. in that truck. You know, I, I don't know. I really don't. I mean, once, once twice year. a year, maybe well, every maybe every oil change, I think would probably be pretty good. Um, I mean, you saw those valves right there. That was ten thousand. Right. So you're running ten to fifteen thousand a year. So twice a year would probably do it a lot of good. I think uh, that's just personal opinion. I don't have anything to back that up with, but uh, that's what I would do. Um, and like I said before, I I don't know. I, it would only concern me a little bit about about the AFR sensors and the and the, and the catalytic, uh, catalysts uh, because like Hondas, Toyotas, BMWs, Volkswagens, Volvos, all all these kind of things, and probably GMs. Uh, newer GMs, newer than what I'm, I'm dealing with right now, uh, they probably all run wideband oxygen sensors or you know AFR sensors, and they're extremely sensitive and extremely expensive. Uh, so I'd be a little bit concerned about maybe what I was putting on the O2s. But again, you know, a company, a company like Lucas or SBP or uh, you know somebody like that, I'm sure they probably got that figured out. 
I wouldn't be scared of it. But I know my um, my dad. He he uses a cap full of sea foam in his bike, and the last bike he had, the only problem he had, it finally uh, dropped the valve. They said when they went into that motor, it was as clean as a brand new. It's motor. crystal clear. It's crystal clean. And, and t- that's all he did. A cap full in his tank on his motorcycle. And I think time he filled up. I think uh, that's probably really good for a motorcycle too because of uh, because they sit for a little while or mm-hmm. you know you know like boats and things like that. You know, stay bill is really good, especially with modern fuel because it's got so much alcohol in it that it you know absorbs so much moisture. Um, that's been the major problem with, with modern fuel is the alcohol content. You know, you see it says 10% or 15% or in some cases 85% or whatever the case is. So that high alcohol content absorbs a lot of moisture. So that fuel, you know, is, is wreaking havoc uh, if you let it sit. So I don't know if you have a boat or a lawnmower or whatever, but I don't know if you've noticed that if it sits for a long time, it's, it's kind of a pain in the neck. <laughs> But cool. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the Facebook feed. We can hang out here. Um, you know, if you guys want to come hang out here next weekend, next Sunday at 6 o'clock, we'd love to have you. Uh, Stuart, I hope to see you again. Uh, Drew, good to have you back. And uh, guys out there, uh, you know what? I'm going to put this up on the on the Facebook thing. So Cliff asked about uh, fuel additives. What do you think? What brands do you like? Do you have good experiences? I'd love to hear what you guys have to say on that. Uh, until next time, we love you guys, and we will see you then. All right, I got a side.